Proceedings podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Monday, March 27th, 2023. Good to have you on board, everybody. Today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Going on 150 years, the members of the Naval Institute have been the foundation for everything we do, from Proceedings, Naval History Magazine, professional books, USNI News, and conferences and events, if you're not a member of the Naval Institute already, you should become one. Go to usni.org forward slash join and become a member today. Okay, let's move to our guest. So in the studio with me today at the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center is Rear Admiral Brad Andros. He is the commander, Navy Expeditionary Combat Command, which is based in Little Creek in Norfolk, Virginia. Admiral Andros, great to have you on the show. Hey, thanks for having me today. So uh, the reason that he's on the show today is that a month ago, his command was in the headlines. And you may not have caught it, uh, depending on what you were looking for, but his command was in the headlines because he was in charge of the recovery operation for the Chinese spy balloon. And so 28 January was kind of when the spy balloon became news in the United States as it drifted over places like Wyoming and Montana and across the Midwest. Uh, it was eventually shot down on the 4th of February off the coast of South Carolina. Sir, take it from there. You're, you, were, you were notified at some point, uh, Fleet Forces Command, I guess, uh, Admiral Cottle, you know, called you in and said, you're in charge. So yeah. what, what was, how did that go? Okay. So um, as it was coming uh, across the continental United States into our uh, sovereign airspace, uh, things started to pick up. And uh, Fleet Forces, with their NAV North hat, uh, reporting to NORTHCOM, uh, was put in charge of if it was going to be an overwater recovery or an overwater shootdown um, to actually put assets in position uh, to track it, uh, make sure that we knew where it landed, uh, and then recover it. Uh, so starting on probably Wednesday of that week, okay. when uh, the president said, hey, that they've given the order to shoot it down, the, the the pace and the planning picked up uh, pretty quickly. We brought in, the team was brought in as part of their crisis action team at Fleet Forces or at NAV North, um, and with Second Fleet, and then down to NECC as the TICOM to do the recovery part. Um, more than just NECC at that point, where you had uh, Coast Guard coming into play, uh, then you had uh, to do security around it, you had a lot of surface ships that were down there to track it. Uh, of course, you had U.S. Navy. Navy warships, yeah. Uh, and you also had uh, in the planning effort of how it was going to be shot down. That was the Air Force at the end of the day uh, through NORTHCOM uh, ordering that. So a lot of planning from probably Wednesday to Saturday of going through that. Uh, phased out, of course, the actual event, the kinetic event of bringing the balloon down. Uh, and then phase two would be the recovery operations. So. A uh, really short window, uh, 12 nautical miles, and keeping it inside the continental or to the United States sovereign territory and airspace. Um, but the, the Air Force did an outstanding job of getting it in that probably three three minute window to be able to get it done. Uh, so, so pause there for yeah. a second. So it's coming across country. The plan is ha is put in place. Correct. Decisions made to wait until it's over water because we don't want it it or the missile remnants to to land potentially on civilians, uh, you know, housing or people, right? So you're yep. going to shoot it down off, off the coast. There's got to be some sort of a closure area, right, to get the fishing vessels and the, you know, small craft and yep. everything out of the area. And then there's a three-minute window from it goes feet wet before it goes outside the 12 nautical mile U.S. territorial seas yeah. to hit it and get it to come down yeah. in those 12, you know, that's pretty, it's that's, really, there's some precision there. A lot, and then the exquisite capability that the Department of Defense and the military brings, right? To be able to pull that off, it's at 60,000 feet, uh, to be able to make the shot, you got really one chance at it. Um, they consummate the shot uh, and then it, it falls out of the air and stays within the territorial limits of the United States. Wow. Pretty amazing, right, when you yeah. think about it. That is. Um, where any, there's, you know, so many things that could potentially go wrong, but the equipment, the people, the training, all aspects of it, uh, to get it done and, and to pull it off is really a testament to how strong our military is. So you're operating under a NORTHCOM hat. Um, was the, did, did you have overall tactical command? In other words, were the, was the Air Force 
working for you? Like, were you saying to the Air Force? No, to shoot? no, okay, no, so no. no. It's like like any other like any other operation, right? There's phases to it. Right. Um, so uh, the part that that where we came into play uh, with with our assets was the recovery part. Got it. So, so that's phase two. Yeah, phase two. After yep. everything's you know we've shot it down. We've we we know generally where it is. Okay, now go find it, Got and it. that's when it transitioned over. And we had. Uh, when they started out, there was lots of different, on the NAV North side, right, the Air Force and the shot down, the shoot down was not down through NAV North, but on the NAV North side, uh, having probably, I think there was three uh, cruiser destroy destroyers out there. Uh, the Coast Guard was securing it. We had an amphib. Uh, Carter Hall was it out there okay. um, as, a, as a float staging base um, to be able to recover stuff. Uh, also had some uh, oceanographic surveying ship was out there as well, um, and so that was that's when we transitioned to phase two. But they were all in p position uh, right when the shoot down happened. Uh, our forces were moving down there uh, because we didn't know until the day of of you know the wide breadth of uh, ocean that it could go uh, could land in. What is it going to come out? You know, North North Carolina, South Carolina. Where was it going to come and, and pop out over? Into the into the sea space, so um, so we pushed our team down there a little bit early. Probably on Saturday, we just moved them south, uh, and they were in position to to set up their location on the shore. So, how big was your team, and what was it composed of? Okay, so the team that we sent down there uh, originally was one expeditionary mine countermeasures company, which consists of uh, EOD divers. Uh, also, uh, some sailors that can run the uh, underwater uh, vehicles, uh, so probably about four or five of them. Uh, uh, vehicles, probably about 10, 12 people. And then also a post-mission analysis cell. So those are the people. The, the UUVs go out and they'll search, um, and they'll take sonar, and then you come back and you analyze the data. So the post-mission analysis cell does that. Um, that was one part of the team. Uh, the next part of the team was the, the headquarters of uh, Mobile Diving and Salvage Unit 2. And so that's an 05 command, uh, really uh, trained and certified to do salvage. Uh, and they were down there, and uh, a guy named Commander Steve Kobos was leading it down, down there. Working, uh, oddly enough, up through our chains, but the lead agency was FBI because it was in, ah, it was, it was in yep. U.S. territory. So uh, FBI had the lead and we were in support. Uh, the other piece of the mud suit that went down there was a mobile diving and salvage company, but they did not go down on land. They stayed up in Little Creek and they got uh, an ocean going tug and they went down on that. Got it. So uh, the, the balloon went down, water depth is from? About 50 to 60, 60 feet okay. uh, off of the Carolinas. It gets, it's shallow for quite some time. Right. Um, and so it was probably about 50 feet. Uh, water temp was probably about 50 to 55 degrees, so. How long did it take to locate it? Um, probably about three days to really get it. Um, looking at all the data, um, 65,000 feet to the surface is a long way. Yep. Uh, pretty good tracking on it, uh, but it's. I'm guessing it, the Aegis equipped ships are tracking it as it comes down. They, they looked at it, they had some good, pretty good data on uh, lots of different pieces and parts and uh, where it dropped off. and. Um, so the, the initial debris field from their data was really large. Um, but some of them you could actually track. Okay, this one, this piece we tracked a little bit further down. So um, that's where we started. Uh, and then it was just analyzing and reanalyzing the data from multiple platforms uh, to look at, okay, which ones and how do they correlate. So, so debris field several miles long? It was probably or? about the main, the main debris field was probably two nautical miles by two nautical miles. Okay. Uh, that's a pretty good size. It's a yeah. really good size. So you're using the, is it knife fish? What are the, the UUVs? Yeah, so both lionfish and knife fish are what we're using, um, which, which bring their own uh, capabilities. Uh, lionfish, a smaller one, uh, we could just, you, you could just put it in the water and hand entry it, uh, and it probably has about it. Eh, we were running two-hour missions on it, and that was kind of the balance between doing the post-mission analysis, uh, because it's, it's one for one, the analysis after you recover it. Um, and then as we got going on it, we used the larger UVs to do larger things and just set up boxes and started searching for it. it. So we had good data points. 
um, and the, the first round in the first probably uh, 72 hours, uh, we're doing some pretty good mapping the debris field, finding out what was right, what was wrong. Uh, the equipment was built to do mine countermeasures. Mm -hmm. So that's looking for metallic pieces that are in the, on, the, on the floor right. of the ocean. Um, so we didn't know. This is uh, one of those first seen pieces. Yeah. And you're like, okay, what's it going to look like? What's, what's the returns going right. to be? What's yeah. it made of? All these things. So the first day we were just getting up on step of saying, okay, this is what I think it looks like. And just a, a really a, 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 a tribute to the sailors, right? Where they sit there and they, it's an unknown. They don't necessarily take the equipment and it's built to do something. Uh, that's not necessarily this, but it can be applied to this. And then going through those first few cycles of saying, okay, this is what it is, go dive on this, give us the feedback. And that quick loop of just trying and figuring out what it is and what the returns, what I'm seeing here on sonar actually was this, okay, now, okay, and then repeating that process and speeding it up. Um, amazing what these sailors can do. So uh, once you find it, uh, and you're pretty sure you've got pieces that you want to go look, then you put in divers in the water. Mm -hmm. So how many divers and, you know, what, what was it like for them in terms of the, the challenge, you know, water murkiness or clarity, uh, you know, the, the temperature you said was about 50 degrees. Yeah. That's not super cold, right? Not so, super cold, but not super warm either. Right. Um, so uh, it's, you, you, the water depth wasn't a problem with divers. Uh, the cold was the limiting factor, but um, the dives were not going to be that long. So we're not going to have somebody down there for 40 minutes trying to find stuff. But what we've got now is the technology probably in the last 20 years, 15 to 20 years, where we now can have a, we got into a pattern of, okay, you can run the UUVs at night because they don't care about the environment right. at all. Yep. So run those in the first part of the evening, then come back, recover them, uh, do the post-mission analysis, and then... Uh, at first light, be ready to go and say, hey, here's all the contacts that we think. Uh, the first thing we would actually do now, another piece of technology we've brought in over the last 15 years, is uh, ROVs from the surface. And so instead of putting a diver in the water and burning uh, them out, yep. just put the ROV down, it's got some sonar on it, it's got a camera Cameras, on it, yep. and you look and you're like, okay, that nope, that's a telephone pole, or nope, that's a fishing net, or a fishing trap. And so then you can, you're not burning through your divers. Uh, as you get it. We brought the EOD team down there uh, as part of the XMCM package uh, because didn't know is there explosive hazards. We knew nothing about it. And so it was, okay, do we clear this? How do we make sure that the, it's explosively safe if we do find something? And then how do we turn it over to the FBI? Uh, that's, that's an aspect I hadn't even thought about. So yeah. EOD guys go down and they, how do, how do they determine that? Well, just from their training, right? They know what they're looking for. They know what actuators look like. They know what uh, an explosive payload would look like. Okay. So uh, going through it and then saying, all right, well, and if it's an unknown or something that doesn't, that looks like it could be, um, actually uh, leaving it in place. Just saying, okay, got it. We just marked it. Let's yep. figure it out. Let's back out and figure it out. Um, so it's just, it was in normal EOD problem at that point. In time, it. And, so. and was there anything of yeah. that concern? No, no, nothing of okay. significance. Got it. So. And uh, so the total number of divers that were there, five, um, ten? I think we had uh, at the end, so uh, after after the first few days, um, what we looked at when the, with the size of the search area, we said, all right, we can sit here and we can just pluck away at this. And my, my boss is Admiral Caudill and, Admiral, and Vice Admiral Dwyer. Both said, Brad, th there's not going to be a time element in this, so don't, don't fret about that. We're in no hurry here. Um, and, but it looked like, okay, this is going to take a little bit longer because, like I said in the beginning, right, 60,000 feet down to the surface, that's great. Uh, but then you have the surface down to 60 feet. And once you get water and you get some pieces and you don't know how much it's broken up and that action, is it going to feather down? Is it going to drift off? Um, modeling the currents, METOC was uh, mm -hmm. exceptional. Um, and, and then mapping, okay, this is where we think it is on the bottom. Uh, it's going to take a while. Right. It's always, it always, salvage always takes a while. Um, so we flooded the zone with some more assets. We sent another XMCM company down there. Uh, we took more dive teams uh, from, from some of the local shore detachments. EOD has shore detachments in Mayport and Kings Bay, other places. But we took them and we moved them into the area as well just to get more boats, more people on the water, yep. being able to cycle it around. Um, so 
flooded the zone with some more assets. By that time, the Mudsu company had gotten down on scene as well. Uh, Mudsu, mobile, mobile diving, diving and salvage, salvage unit. unit. Okay. Yep. And so that's about, so the diver's there. I'm not answering your question. The diver's there. Uh, so Mudsu company is about 20, okay. 20 people. Um, the XMCM, the diving portion of it, is probably eight people. Uh, and then when coming from the shore depths, we got another two dive teams. So we had, at the end, four dive teams down there, diving and salvage company um, going after it, ROVs for all those 11-meter uh, ribs um, moving out and, and, and launching and recovering the UUVs. I think at the end, we probably had about 18 UUVs down there. Wow. So, wow. so I'm guessing there's a lot of unscheduled great training for you. Uh, well, uh, super opportunity to learn. Um, You've got a really permissive environment. Um, you've got a type commander that's now doing force employment. Um, you have uh, a lot, you know, the national national media on it. Everybody wants an answer pretty quickly. Uh, and then working with Second Fleet, right? So working with the fleet yep. uh, to do this and then actually getting uh, command and control going through the TICOM and down um, and, and being assigned assets. At the end, we also brought in uh, some helicopters for their uh, aircraft mine countermeasures. And we also had uh, the Carter Hall came back down and they came underneath our, our C2. So really awesome uh, for us to do it because we have that as uh, one of the tasks from fleet forces is to be able to command and control and have a flag led C2 element. Uh, and we exercised it, we've exercised it in the past in DISCA. Uh, we've exercised it in uh, large battle problems and, and, and things like that. But to actually have that and working through Second Fleet was a great opportunity. We learned a lot. And did you stay in Norfolk for the whole time? Or yes. Did you? Okay. Stayed in Norfolk for the whole time. Uh, that was the, the, the key place to be, to be able to communicate and, and be able to work with NAP North and the Second Fleet. So. so from the time that you got the first call and uh, Admiral Cottle said, you're, you're it for phase two, yeah. till you secured, how, how long was that? Was it a week or so? Or? I think it ended up being about 10 days. Uh, we got weathered out in the middle. Uh, we probably worked for 72 hours and then... Uh, seas picked up pretty good. Probably, I think at the end, they were about uh, six feet to eight feet, which really started impacting it. Um, we had found some stuff uh, and had some good contacts uh, before the weather set in, uh, but then we went and reevaluated them afterwards. Got it. So. And I know from our, our USNI news coverage that you turned it over, the, the debris, the stuff that you found, you turned it over to FBI because they were, as you said, the supported commander. and. Um, can you, can you tell us anything about what you found, what you brought up? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll direct you to the FBI on that one. They're still the lead agency on this one. Yeah. Um, and uh, we found, uh, you know, stuff that we think was possibly part of the balloon. Um, and then, but uh, we, we, we tried to maintain focus on our tasks at hand, which was just recover stuff. Uh, and then hand it over and not do it. We didn't know, no evaluation, no analysis of it. It was just, uh, if you see some things that may look like it doesn't belong there, pick it up and give it over to them. And so uh, at first we, you know, you saw the pictures of all the stuff that was the surface debris. That was easy. Right. That was most of the, the, the parachute and, uh, or not the parachute, the balloon uh, nylar uh, uh, fabric. And so we pushed that over to them on the first night and then uh, we actually started setting some stuff up with uh, Carter Hall to, to, to move it to there and just stay everything at sea. But we were operating from the shore for most of it. Got it, got it. All right, well, that, that must have been an exciting 10 days of your life to... It was get, fun. It was yeah. really, really fun. It was, uh, it's, uh, you can see that uh, everybody on the team was excited to do it. Uh, it was practicing and, and, and being able to command and control uh, such a such a force was interesting for the team. Yeah, so I want to step back a little bit, and uh, so you started your career, it, and your entire career was as an EOD officer, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So you graduated from the Naval Academy in 1994, went into EOD. What what drew you to EOD? And then maybe uh, tell our listeners something that they don't know about EOD. Okay. Um. Yeah, so 1994, uh, back then, and there's been a big change since 1994, that's a long time ago, the, you, you first went out to a ship and uh, qualified as a surface warfare officer. It could be any kind of ship, it could be a mine countermeasures, it could be an amphib, uh, it could be a salvage ship, we had salvage ships back then. 
Um, so I went to uh, USS Safeguard in Hawaii, and I qualified. They went to EOD school. Salvage ship, right? Yep. Safeguard, Sa yeah, Safeguard was a salvage ship. Um, and then went to EOD school. So uh, after that, uh, did an OIC with a platoon, or their platoons now, they were detachments back then, of about eight sailors and uh, an officer. And then just kind of moved along like any other career. Um, went on to be a XO, be a CO, uh, and then major command. And that's the first part uh, for an EOD officer at major command, you're either um, gonna do stay just EOD stuff or you're gonna work into more of a task force working for a fleet commander. So I was lucky enough to, and I think I was lucky enough, other guys that went to groups probably thought they were lucky too, um, to, to work at fifth fleet. Did you do yeah. time in Afghanistan or Iraq? I uh, did one deployment to Iraq uh, for a counter IED deployment, uh, part of the surge in 2000, I want to say 2007, 2000, yeah, it must have been right. 2008, yep. 2007, 2008, 2008 time frame, uh, when I was the XO of EOD Mobile Unit 6. So uh, we had uh, the EOD, the counter IED teams that were spread from Baghdad just a little bit south out to the Iran border. Wow. So. So now step us up to NECC, because we don't have a lot of uh, NECC contributors to proceedings, and that's a hint, that's a foot stopper, <laughs> uh, that's a challenge yeah. for the Admiral here. But um, uh, So Navy Expeditionary Co Combat Command, you've got EOD, you got CBs, yep. uh, you got diving, salvage, yeah. what else is in the bag? So in the bag, so just I'll go back real quick about NECC stood up in 2006. Um, and it was, uh, so again, right, very much the GWAT. Right, um, post very 9 much 11. Post 9-11, yeah. Navy response to it of uh, a lot of requirements coming in from the Joint Force for Iraq and Afghanistan. Yep. Uh, individual augmentees, uh, any kind of sailors that work ashore. Uh, how do we do this? And the Navy looked at it and said, okay, we probably need a type commander to do this, uh, to make sure that we're taking all the joint requirements uh, and what's needed and something that the Navy doesn't necessarily, isn't built to do. Right. Um, and how do we make sure that we've got the right certifications, the right training, the right equipment? So NECC was formed to do that. Uh, underneath NECC, uh, we took the EOD, uh, Diving and Salvage, the CBs. Uh, we took Expeditionary Supply, yep. uh, which is was mostly a reserve component piece, and now it's mostly still, it's probably 85% <clears throat> reserve, um, but we do have one active battalion. Um, you've got Navy Ex uh, Expeditionary Intelligence Command, which does some human and, and some tactical. Yep. Uh, and then the last piece of it, we have what's now called the Maritime Expeditionary Security Force, which actually started in 2006 as the Riverine Force, and got then it. went a little bit coastal Riverine, and yep. now we're back to uh, MESF. And if you look back at their heritage, there are a whole bunch of different things that were pre-GWAT that have kind of been put together. So harbor security, coastal surveillance, um, doing high-value uh, unit escorts, um, being the, the teams that embark on uh, logistic ships to do point defense. So there's a myriad of different tasks that that, that part of the force does. So that's. That's it. So it's kind of like, it's not like the other type commanders where you have, you know, air warfare, uh, surface, subsurface, all the different pieces. This one, you've got a whole different capabilities under one roof. Um, and then putting them together and, and, and moving them and making sure that you get efficiencies in equipment, um, making sure that the training uh, reflects the environment they're going to. Um, it was it, it was really a smart move, I think, by the Navy. Um, so moving forward to this, yes. Um, how do you do it? I think at the core, you remember that you're a Tycho, right? And so, uh, we're, so we're man, man training and equipping man training, equip, organize, focus, right? Okay, yep. um, and so when it, it's when you say NECC. It could be anything. It could be a lot. Right. So it's a global TICOM um, where I've got bosses at Fleet Forces and at Pack Fleet. And so there's NEC and there's NEC Pack. We have a detachment out in the Pacific in Hawaii uh, that, that covers all the BSO 60 or the Pack Fleet assets. Uh, and they go up, we go up to Admiral Paro for that for man train, equip, and certify. Uh, and then we go for the East Coast units, we go up through. Um, so how big is the total force, roughly? Total force about 20,000. Okay. It's probably 50-50 uh, between active and reserve component. Got it. So. So you work a lot with Admiral Mustin then? Admiral Mustin as well, yes. Um, I'm very interested in working 
where he's going with the reserve component is 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 really going to be it's going to increase our ability exponentially. Uh, I'm really excited where he's going with that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, how is, you know, I mean, your, your command was born out of GWAT, right? Yeah. Uh, and now that we're in, you know, pure threat competition, U.S., China, Russia, there's an ongoing war in Ukraine, uh, how are things shifting either towards the Pacific or with lessons out of Russia, Ukraine. I'm sure that that's having an impact on your force in terms of force laydown, but also in in terms of capabilities that you're developing or thinking of that you know that you need. Yeah, um, it, it is. It's a shift. I think it's a shift for the impar- uh, entire department. Um, my predecessor Joe DeGuardo did a really good job uh, last year of saying, "Hey, we got to look at our design. How's our force organized?" Uh, are we built and structured uh, to make the transition from the global war on terrorism into a near-peer uh, fight or a modern 21st century warfare yep. uh, with all the domains? Um, and what we found was a lot of changes when NECC stood up was to get after and how we built the force and organized was to support the joint force and the requirements that were coming in. The example I'll give is the EOD platoon. Uh, we made it and we expanded the size of them so that we could have three counter IED teams. Got and so it. that was needed, and that was the right decision. And as we go back and we're looking at it, is what are we being asked to do now? What are the naval component commanders, what do they need? They may not need a size force. They don't need three counter IED teams, they need one EOD teams. So how do you structure that? Do you make it smaller? Uh, and so that you can have more capacity? Um, and that's what we chose to do. We're making it smaller right now. Uh, each team because you don't need the three counter IED teams. You need like the dive team. Uh, you need the, the UXO. You need the, an EOD team. So uh, doing that organization. So we've done that across, uh, looking at the CB uh, and how they are certified uh, and changing that up a little bit to say, all right, what is the Navy going to need from our CBs? What are the core things? And looking at and then balancing that of, um, okay, how do we certify that? How are we making sure that the what we're producing in readiness meets that need. And so when we look at the, the, the CBs, it was we would certify a battalion and we would train them up and we'd go to, through and say, all right, exercise this, show me that you can do this, and we would certify the entire battalion. And then when the battalion would go out, the numbered fleet or the Navy component commander would say, I've got all these tasks for you to do and go out and do them. So what we did is we went back and was like, okay, in conflict, what are going to be the key tasks that we think that we're going to need? And we talked to everybody about it. And it was mostly port damage repair, right? Mm. Going in for the infrastructure of a port um, and airfield damage repair. And so we looked at it and we said, all right, well, how do we certify to that? And so we kind of flipped it on its, on its head a little bit and said, instead of certifying battalions, it'll still be the same form and function. It'll still be a battalion, um, but taking parts of that and saying, we're going to certify this mission set, we're going to certify this mission set. Uh, and it's probably about three or four different mission sets. So now we're giving the component commander, the Navy component commanders, something that says, hey, we've certified it for you that you can break it down like this. You can use it however you want. It's still certified as a battalion. But we are giving you more um, confidence that these teams, if you break them apart to do this, they can do it exquisitely well. And are the certifications for the Atlantic battalions and the Pacific battalions the same? Or same. They, they're the same? Okay. Exact same. Interesting. Exact same. Because okay. um, 20,000 people uh, in the units of action, we have 63 commands. Uh, we've got, that can break down into about 300 plus units of action. Okay. So it's not, it's 05 commands, 63 of those. But then when you break it down further than that of the teams, EOD platoons, or a uh, security boat company, or a security platoon, uh, you get down to about 300. And that's how we kind of, that's how we go out. That's how we fight, is in those small units. And uh, on the procurement side, you know, we hear about, in, in proceedings, a lot about, you know, F-35 and MQ-25 and DDG-X, et cetera, right? Um, but in your world, we don't, we don't hear a lot about the, you know, the stuff that you're buying. And right. You mentioned, you know, the um, on you know, the USVs, and uh, uh, what are some other things that you're looking to either you're currently procuring and you want more of, mm-hmm. or that you're looking at procuring capabilities that you think, hey, three, five, ten years from now, we need to be able to, you know, we need this 
gizmo to be able to procure. Yeah, I think in that space, uh, two things. One, uh, the expeditionary logistics, and we're having really, really good success uh, with pack fleet, fleet forces, and and with OpNav on uh, saying, hey, this is this is the capability that's needed. Uh, this is the equipment that's needed to do that, and that's what we have to procure. Um, when you look at expeditionary logistics, it's a whole bunch, uh, the subgroups in that, it's uh, surface cargo companies, so unloading Mipsharon ships, um, being able to operate in a, a port facility and be able to move cargo around, uh, also from an, an APOD or an SPOD. Um, and then also doing an expeditionary reload, which is uh, taking all the, the munitions and being able to put them on a ship, uh, whether that's VLS or just moving it, whatever, five inch, you know, uh, rounds down there. Um, but that takes an exquisite capability. Um, and then also doing refueling uh, in an expeditionary manner. Think P3s, think uh, setting up uh, uh, a FARP, right. uh, that capability. So in that space, uh, when we look at DMO, uh, that's changed, you know, spreading the fleet out has put a demand on that. Yep. So we've communicated, hey, this is the, the kind of equipment that we need to, to get to do that. And this is how it's different than GWAT to support the Navy. Very well responded to in, in the resourcing uh, phase of that one. Um, as I yeah, look, Are you working with Marines on that? Because I know that, that we've got a lot of Marines writing about logistics. Right, and, and, there's and, a huge overlap in okay. capabilities, right, yeah. with the Marines. Uh, there's just... The, the capabilities are there, the same. There's little nuanced differences, um, but the, it's the capacity build, right? The, you think the Marines and CBs historically together, right? Um, and and will continue to be together as we're doing EABOs and ANBs and, and outfitting those. So that that demand uh, is, is well captured, um, and building that force up, and so. It, taking the next piece, the CBs of what we would need moving forward is um, building the right capacity, the right uh, pieces. We haven't been asked to do port damage repair in a long time, mm. right? Um, dredging capabilities, uh, looking at what's the right equipment to do it. Luckily, not much of our stuff is really high tech, right? It's construction equipment. Got it. Um, so there's not much R&D that does to it. There's some aspects of R&D that will make us better and be able to sustain forward in a different manner. Um, and uh, we've got some good R&D going into that. But uh, not a huge budget. You, you don't hear much about it because it's not going to be in the billions of dollars. Yep. Um, I think the one thing, if I look forward, and it's uh, the task that Admiral Caudill and Admiral Paparo have, have given to, to me, uh, and we're working through it, is what does force protection look like? Mm. Um, a lot of the roots that we have right now, you hear, we talk anti-terrorism force protection. Right. That's very GWAT. Yep. Um, asymmetric threat, got it. Um, history of the coal, right? Yep. Um, counter piracy stuff. Uh, yeah, that, it's, not, it's that, not ballistic missiles coming in. Right, but that's, right. Been, that's yeah. been the formative of how we've built this up. Right. Um, so what does force protection look like? What does it look like from in the 21st century where we have UUVs, we have USVs, um, we have uh, UAVs, our adversaries have the same capabilities. Sure. So now it's, okay, what does it look like in the 21st century? How it go from the seafloor up into air and do the asymmetric piece? Um, the missiles coming in, maybe not, right? right. We'll, we'll, we'll have air defense on that. Um, but how do we have a, a standard uh, capability to take the asymmetric uh, from the seabed up into the air? And that's around whatever that critical infrastructure is, whether it be a base or a place, yep. um, or even if it's just some piece of um, technology or, or some node that uh, either in CONUS or overseas is critically important to making sure that the fight stays forward. Uh, last question, because it's on the minds of everybody from the Commandant of the Marine Corps to the CNO. Talked a lot about at West this year, uh, recruiting and retention. So how, how you know, are, are young kids these days wanting to be Navy divers and, and EOD technicians? You know, do you, do you have a good, you know, are you meeting your, your requirements in terms of the, the inflow and the retention of, of sailors? Um, I think we will. Uh, if you look at recruiting writ large, uh, it's, a, it's a tough environment yeah. um, in, in getting the people in. 
I will say that we still have a lot of uh, young Americans that do want to serve. Uh, and it's finding those that have the ability or the desire to go EOD uh, or go diver. Uh, because you have, to, you have to find the person that's got uh, the ability to critically think, um, that can understand and, and come into a, a situation not knowing what they're coming into and then trying to figure it out. And, and finding those people has historically been hard. Um, what we've, again, adapting uh, to the times is looking at our model of bringing people in to uh, recruit training and then getting them and producing them at the end. Our model so heretofore has been bringing a lot of people, put them through some training and a tritum and figure out which ones of that group Got it. Uh, you can. So, so pretty high attrition in the past. Huge high attrition, yep. right? Um, so then re-looking at that and saying, hey, in, in that mold, somebody that had probably 80% of the skills isn't going to make it through. And so now we're looking at uh, the team is how do we just expand that? Because if we just raise uh, the number that we get through from at one point, it's like 12%, right? It's a 90% attrition. Wow. Right. Uh, if we just raise that up. Uh, we'll still be able to produce at the end of it uh, what we need. Which, right. Again, small force, uh, not many people. We need to produce uh, less than 100 a year. Well, sir, um, parting shots, you got any save rounds? You know, I think uh, wrapping it all up with the balloon, uh, with NECC, uh, what I will say is I, I'm always amazed at the, the talents of the sailors that we do have. They, uh, they can take any problem uh, and they can come up with a solution to it. Um, it's, it's my job to make sure that they're in a position that they can do that, um, that they can have a, a library of things that they may encounter, um, know why they're doing what they're doing, and they really get out of their way because they're pretty impressive Americans. Uh, they can solve a lot of problems. And uh, I think when I look at it with all the stuff we did off of South Carolina, it was the sailors and uh, the junior leaders down there that really, really um, took the situation and, 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 and went forward and came That's up great. with some good, That's great. good analysis. Well, my guest today has been Rear Admiral Brad Andros. He is the commander of Navy Expeditionary Combat Command based in Little Creek, Virginia. Sir, great to have you on board, and uh, thanks for stopping hey, by uh, thanks for the Naval me. Institute. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast brought to, brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Since 1873, the membership of the Naval Institute has been the foundation of all we do. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. And if you like the show, ring the bell, tell, tell your friends, subscribe to the show. And uh, until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.